In 1831, at the age of 22, Charles Darwin set off on a voyage that would change not only his life, but ours as well. A naturalist on a British naval ship, the Beagle, Darwin traveled around South America and beyond. What he saw on an isolated group of islands out here in the Pacific began an intellectual voyage that would last some 20 years and would culminate in the then shocking idea that living things are not designed according to an unchangeable plan, but instead are shaped by the world around them. When the Beagle finally anchored here in the Galapagos in September of 1835, Darwin was very excited about coming here. He was really fascinated with the geology of the place, particularly the volcanic origins of these islands. But when he actually set foot on the shore, he was very disappointed in this place. In fact, this is what he wrote. Nothing could be less inviting than the first appearance. A broken field of black basaltic lava is everywhere covered by a stunted brushwood which shows little signs of life. The dry and parched surface, having been heated by the noonday sun, gave the air a close and sultry feeling, like that from a stove. 600 miles off the South American coast, the Galapagos Islands are actually the tips of volcanoes that have pushed their way above the ocean surface. The oldest islands were formed some two to three million years ago. The youngest, including the biggest, Isabella, are a few hundred thousand years old, with volcanoes that still erupt. My visit to the Galapagos is to take me to over half the dozen or so major islands, including one whose volcanic origins are only too apparent. These rocks look like they're laid out in a circle. Yeah, this is uh, Devil's Crown. It's an old eroded crater that's uh, very shallow here in the middle. We're in the middle of a crater, a volcanic crater? Yeah. It's not gonna erupt though, don't worry. How do you know? It's old, it's eroded. I've seen a lot of old things erupt. It's full of water. Me. <laughs> I'm really surprised at how, how lush everything is. Yeah. That's, that's the El Nino. My guide on this trip is Lynn Fowler, a biologist who has spent much of her life in the islands. What, what is this trail here? That's, that's the land iguana trail. So it's at the end of this trail we might find an iguana. We find one, let's see. And here, as if waiting patiently for our arrival, is a creature that Darwin was not immediately impressed by. When Darwin first saw these land iguanas, he thought they looked slow and stupid. In fact, there's a funny story he tells about that. Darwin was watching a land iguana burrow, and making a hole somewhat like this one, with just his tail sticking out. And Darwin gave the tail a little yank and the, the iguana backed out of the hole and turned around and looked at him, as if to say, what did you do that for? What Darwin interpreted as stupidity in the island's land iguanas is in fact an extraordinary indifference to humans that's shared by all the Galapagos animal life, and that Darwin repeatedly noted in his account of his voyage. He took advantage of it in his several encounters with the Galapagos Islands' most famous residents, the giant tortoises. As I was walking along, I met two large tortoises, each of which must have weighed at least 200 pounds. These huge reptiles seemed to my fancy like some antediluvian animals. I was always amused when overtaking one of these great monsters as it was quietly pacing along to see how suddenly, the instant I passed, it would draw in its head and legs and uttering a deep hiss, fall to the ground with a heavy sound as if struck dead. I frequently got on their backs, and then giving a few raps on the hinder part of their shells, they would rise up and walk away. But I found it very difficult to keep my balance. <laughs> Today, visitors to the Galapagos usually pay their respects to the handful of giant tortoises that are housed at the research station here, named for Charles Darwin. Although getting to feed them is a privilege reserved for the foolhardy. Hello. What a look in his eye. Oh, yeah, yeah. My problem is I not only saw E.T., I also saw Jurassic Park. <laughs> in Darwin's day, the giant tortoises were still being hauled away by the thousands to provide fresh meat for whaling ships. That's a little too close to my fingers, you can have it. 
The governor of the Galapagos told Darwin that he could tell by the shape of its shell which island the tortoise came from. The saddleback tortoise, for instance, comes from the island of Española. At the time, Darwin paid little attention to the governor's claim, but it was to be the foundation for everything that followed. Soon, he saw for himself how creatures could be recognizably different from one island to the next. These mockingbirds, like the saddleback tortoise, are from the island of Española. These mockingbirds are having a flick fight. They flick their wings and their tail back and forth. It's a territorial display between two big groups of mockingbirds that are families, and they're disputing what's going on at the territorial boundary. So they, they do this big display saying, you know, if you cross this boundary, this is what's going to happen to you. It's going to be bad. Dave Anderson is one of the few biologists with permission to come to the Galapagos year after year to pursue his research. The rules governing his visits are strict, and everything he brings in must go out. Mockingbirds are a constant presence in his camp on Española, and they seem eager to volunteer for a show and tell. On this island, the mockingbird species is larger than on other islands, and on this island, the beak is uh, long and curved. They use that to move dirt around. They dig more on this island than on other islands. And also, the breast feathers are whitish and speckled, and some of the other species are much cleaner in the breast. The point is that nearby islands have very different looking birds. It's no problem for even an amateur birder to know the difference between species of mockingbirds. In addition to the Española mockingbirds, two other islands have their own distinct species. Then there's a fourth species common across most of the islands, including here on the northeasternmost island, Henaveza. They all look a little different depending on the island yeah. they come from. Yeah. So, for example, those Española birds had a lot of speckling on their breast, and this one really doesn't. This one's got a clean white breast. Looks cleaner all the way around. Those Española birds look sort of ratty and dirty. Are you going to let them go? Um, yeah. Okay. We can try hypnotizing. Oh. Can he fly if he's hypnotized? He'll go to sleep. Mockingbirds joined the giant tortoises on Darwin's list of creatures that, for some mysterious reason, were slightly different on different islands. All right, I will now make this mockingbird wake up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even give him a post-hypnotic suggestion. That was amazing. Dale, dale. During his five weeks in the Galapagos, Darwin visited only four of the islands. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that great? Howdy, bud. <laughs> Yet he managed to collect hundreds of specimens of birds, animals, and plants. This was one of the islands, Darwin. Yeah, this is uh, Floriana. This is his second stop, actually, in the Galapagos. By now, Darwin was becoming increasingly excited by the natural history of the islands. Everywhere, he was seeing what he called aboriginal creations, animals and plants found nowhere else, what biologists now call endemic species. On Floriana alone, he identified 21 endemic plants. So what, what plants here are, are, are endemic to this island? Well, here we've got uh, Lecocarpus, this little uh, yellow daisy, and this one here with the hairy leaves, this is Scalacea velosa. And once again, Darwin noticed that different islands had their own unique versions, including a species of Scalacea that grows into a 30-foot tree. But there was something else besides the uniqueness of the plants and animals here. They seemed to Darwin to bear a striking resemblance to those he'd just seen in South America. And a tremendous idea began to germinate. Perhaps here in the Galapagos, he was close to nothing less than the origin of species. The natural history of these islands is eminently curious and well deserves attention. Most of the organic productions are aboriginal creations found nowhere else. There's even a difference between the inhabitants of the different islands. The archipelago is a little world within itself, or rather a satellite attached to America, whence it has derived a few stray colonists. Hence, both in space and time, 
we seem to be brought somewhere near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. It would be two more years the Beagle's voyage finally over before the mystery of mysteries began to resolve itself in his mind. It happened as he was puzzling over another group of creatures that, while he was here, he hadn't paid much attention to. The little birds now called Darwin's finches. And this goes down, right? Yep. We're setting up a mist net to catch one of the group of birds that has become literally synonymous with Darwin and his theory of evolution. This just needs to be loose like this? Yeah, what happens is the bird flies in and doesn't see it, and so it carries the net out with it with its momentum and then sags down, hanging like this in a little bag. Can they hear that? It's not to go like this. Do you do that when you've been here too long? Uh, birders act like they know what they're doing, and they make these little squeaky sounds, and they all pretend like it makes a difference. <laughs> I don't know if it does or not. <laughs> well, you got one. You got one. It's a sharp-beak ground finch. We'll get it by Our bizarre calls have netted us a bird from one of the 13 different species of finches in the Galapagos, birds that are today known collectively as Darwin's finches. Beautiful. Now, what is this again? This is the sharp beak ground finch. This is the smallest ground finch on this island. It's got a pointy little beak that's great for grass seeds. Today, Darwin's finches are in all the textbooks as the classic example of how living things adapt to their environment. Each of the 13 species in the Galapagos has a different beak that suits its lifestyle, from feeding off cactus flowers to using twigs to dig out insects from the bark of trees. A group of species known as ground finches are the most common. This is the large ground finch, with the thick, heavy beak perfect for cracking open large, tough seeds. The sharp-beaked ground finch, by contrast, eats mainly small seeds. If you gave this guy a gram of small seeds to eat, it would get done a lot faster than with this guy. He's just got too much beak in the way. He's got too much equipment there, yeah. yeah. It's, it's too big, it's too bulky. Yeah. yeah, he can handle it, but not fast enough. Yeah, so he'd have to spend more energy on feeding himself, and he needs the energy <laughs> to do it. <laughs> yeah, his, his net intake would probably be negative. Wow, so he, so he could, although he's probably eating all day long, he could eventually starve to death. Yeah, yeah, he, he's got expenses. He's got yeah. overhead, he's yes, got to pay. Right. too much overhead. And, you know, you look at the body sizes, and he's got a lot more overhead yeah. than this one. Yeah. Contrary to legend, Darwin himself didn't pay much attention to the dull little birds that often hopped around his feet. He collected several dozen while he was here, but he didn't even bother to label them or note which island they came from. But by a delicious twist of fate, it's the finches on one of the Galapagos Islands, an island Darwin didn't even visit, that have become the single best proof that his theory of evolution is no longer only a theory, but an observable fact. Yep. Yep. As we approach the island, I can see why Darwin never landed here. You mean on the face of that cliff? Right there. Yep. It's, it looks a little worse from here than it really is. It or maybe not. It's not only a cliff, the cliff sticks out at the top. The island, called Daphne Major, is only a mile or so across. For some quarter century now, a team of biologists and a string of graduate students, including briefly Dave Anderson, have been coming here every year. Okay. All right. It's kind of like a spider. The researcher's single purpose has been to weigh and measure every one of the few hundred ground finches that share this lump of volcanic rock with low, rather scrubby vegetation, some seabirds, and not much else, apart from the occasional grumpy sea lion. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just passing through. Why do people go to all this trouble of getting on this thing? What, uh, what, what's the significance to science of Daphne Major? Well, there's some folks who call Daphne Major the laboratory of evolution. 
Um, it's a really great place to see evolution actually happening because the system, uh, the biological system is relatively simple. Not too many components and uh, it, for the finches it kind of boils down to what seeds are here and what tool do I have to crack those seeds. The main ground finch here is about halfway in size between the two species Dave and I looked at earlier. What the researchers have found is that when small seeds are plentiful, usually in rainy years, the beaks of the birds born the following year are also, on average, smaller. When there are plenty of large seeds in drier years, the next generation has beaks that are larger. This is evolution, and its driving force, Darwin's great insight, is natural selection. Here's what's happening. In every generation of finches, there's a range of beak sizes, some a little smaller than the average, some a little larger. When small seeds are plentiful, when there's been plenty of rain, the smaller beaked birds are the more efficient eaters, so they thrive and produce more offspring than the larger beaked birds. The result is that in the next generation, there are more small than large beaked birds. The average beak size is smaller than the last generation the population has evolved. When conditions change and a dry year brings more large seeds than small, then large-beaked birds do better. They leave more offspring, and the population shifts toward a larger average beak size. Smaller to larger, larger to smaller. It's these subtle shifts in beak size that the researchers have so meticulously documented. The really significant thing they found is that oscillating back and forth, that the size of the beak really does change over short periods of time and they know exactly why it's because their food supply changes and that's that's a case of actually seeing evolution in in, in progress to see it as it happens yeah yeah the really cool thing about this for, for everybody scientists and everybody else is that it, there's no question that it is evolution happening in front of our eyes we don't have to think of evolution as being something that you only get from the fossil record or theorizing about you can go to a place like Daphne Major where it's simple and you can actually see the evolution happening on a almost a monthly basis but certainly an annual basis I've often heard people say people sympathetic to the idea of evolution that you have to uh, take a little bit of it on faith but uh, you don't have to take any of it on faith. Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Not after this study. People visit here. Uh, not just scientists. They need a trail that's established. It's wonderfully appropriate that evolution should move from theory to fact in the study of Darwin's finches. Because it was while Darwin himself was trying to make sense of his haphazard finch collection that the idea of evolution first occurred to him. With it, he could explain not only why different islands have different finches, but also different mockingbirds, different plants, different tortoises. From the time their ancestors arrived in the archipelago, the animals on different islands have gone their own independent ways, shaped by the conditions they found themselves in, until eventually they became different species. As for how their ancestors got here, well, we're coming to that. Getting here was no problem for the ancestors of the Galapagos sea lion. Lynn Fowler has promised me an underwater rendezvous with a sea lion pup. And this being the Galapagos, there's an eager volunteer. The Galapagos sea lion, like most of the creatures here, has changed since it arrived, evolving into a smaller version of its California cousin. Your statement is like, so what are you going to do? <laughs> what, what do you want to do? Sea lions can swim, but how did land animals get way out here in the Pacific Ocean? The explanation I've heard was that they came on floating rafts of vegetation. But iguanas and tortoises are hefty creatures. So they had to have a pretty hefty raft to get over here. Yeah. Well, they're big chunks of land that come down some of those rivers on the South American continent. And they float way out here. It's no, 600 miles. An Take actual chunk of, of land. I yeah. thought it was just like, uh, you know, 
twigs or branches. There are chunks of land that even have standing trees that have been seen floating way out to sea in the ocean. And those could easily bring several species at once to a yeah. system like this. Of all the immigrants here, few have adapted so successfully to island life as the marine iguanas. Wherever you go along the shoreline, iguanas will be on display, sometimes literally. He's green on the top and red along his body. What is that? Uh, yeah, that's a, breed that? a breeding male. It's the uh, coloration that Oh, that's get, a signal that he's, that that he's ready he's to ready. breed. Yeah, nice. then he'll set up a territory and uh, try to attract some females to it. Uh -huh. But that's a big breeding male. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, what does he do to attract females? Is just just that, display his color? that uh, the head, head bobbing? Yeah, oh, that's it's, there. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, right. Look, babe, I can do 20 push-ups. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I'm the man for you. That's kind of stuff. <laughs> he's a beauty, though, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Doesn't that look like Godzilla? Yeah. Charles Darwin, had he ever heard of Godzilla, might have agreed. It is a hideous-looking creature, stupid and sluggish in its movements. When in the water, this lizard swims with perfect ease and quickness by a serpentine movement of its body and flattened tail, the legs being motionless and collapsed at its sides. I opened the stomachs of several and found them largely distended with minced seaweed. Darwin put his finger on just those adaptations that have made the marine iguana fit so perfectly into its island home. The only ones is greens, huh? I mean, yeah, uh -huh. vegetables. All that, all that uh, sea lettuce, ova, is their favorite food. The ancestors of these creatures were like all the other lizards in the world, swimming only when they had to. We made it cut up the cliff. But the Galapagos marine iguanas, as their name implies, have turned to the sea to sustain them, eating as virtually their only food, the bright green algae that grows all along and beneath the shoreline. Not only have they become expert swimmers, they've also developed the ability to digest the algae with the help of a bacterium that lives in their hind gut. This specialization has made the marine iguanas the lords of the seashore but it has also left them extremely vulnerable. Martin Wikelski has witnessed their vulnerability firsthand. What was this like during that last great El Nino? Well, it was, it was horrible. Those guys are about 10% of all the animals that were here. There were 10 times as many 10 animals. 10 times as many. And they were going to forage. They were trying to get the last bits of algae and then slowly walking up the beach and sometimes they didn't make it up the beach, so they would just sort of put one foot forward and still try to go up, but then really bake in the sand, literally. And they just all died in front of our eyes. So we had, I think, like 400 dead animals during a few weeks. That's pretty amazing. Now, was that because all the green that we see here was not here? Yeah. All this green you see was totally black. There was absolutely nothing growing on these rocks. The cause of the devastation was the 1997-98 El Nino, a plume of unusually warm water that wreaked havoc with weather patterns all over the globe. Its impact on the Galapagos was more direct, bathing the islands in warm water and driving out the cold, nutrient-rich currents that normally sustain the marine life here. Everything on and around the islands that lives off the sea suffered. But the marine iguanas, whose sole source of food withered away, suffered the most. But it turns out that even during good years, the marine iguanas here in the island of Henevesa have to struggle to make a living. Why do we see so many smallish iguanas here? Right. This island gets least of the nutrients, and that means this, this algae... Uh, pro you probably saw iguanas foraging already. Yes, So yeah. they, they sometimes have these huge algae pastures, yeah, and they, yeah, they just get a, a mouthful of algae every bite. But here they only have a tiny little carpet of algae, and they constantly have to scrape it off. So and that has selected out the big right, ones. absolutely. The big ones yeah. th that might be born here right. just aren't going to get enough nutrients. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's interesting. So, so there they are. That's the product of natural selection right, right. there. But even among these smaller-than-average animals, some of the males are clearly larger. This big guy uh -huh. has walked through the entire collection yeah. doing that nodding thing, which right. is to, his, right. to announce his territory, right? right. But is he the only one in this whole batch oh. that's, that's uh, like, dominant like that? He's the hotshot. He's yeah. definitely the, the prize male because you see all these females around here. Yeah. They all like to hang out with him. So the females are the ones who choose in that system, and the males just try to do the best to be chosen. The females are attracted to this big, handsome guy. Right. 
this ugly thing here. But, but <laughs> hey, it's not ugly. I know you. I know you come here every day, and you kind of like the way they look now. But I'm telling you, <laughs> I just got here. <laughs> you should be here 30 days, and you like them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yes, Martin actually does spend the entire 30 days the iguanas here are deciding on mates, watching to see which males the females pick. It's an important decision. Each of those females only has one egg. Oh, really? It's, it's absolutely amazing. So, they have about 25% of their body mass in one egg. So it really counts who they choose. Absolutely. Martin is trying to understand why, if the big guys are so popular, the group here also contains a number of much smaller males who, instead of showing off, keep a deliberately low profile. You see that guy? He was sort of sneaking up on the female, trying to, to get her. That's one of these small sneaker males that hang out in the territories. And they, they try to sort of sneak up on the females. They're about the female size, so mm. the, the, the male can't tell them from females. Well, they so they, they just try to sneak up on females and, and try to mate with them if they can. So in a way, he, he gets a, an advantage. He has a chance to, to sneak up because right. he's, imper he's a female impersonator from, right. Uh, right, right up until the, yeah. the, the, the last moment. Yeah. yeah. There must be some reason the females accept the sneakers, or natural selection would have long since eliminated them. Martin's hypothesis is that keeping smallness genes around provides the females with a sort of insurance policy against those brutal El Nino years, when being big can be fatal. And that seems to be sort of a long-term strategy that they, they can't really know when the next El Nino hits. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they might just choose a, a small guy as a mating partner to have some smaller offspring. And at some other times they might choose a bigger one. One year you try it big, next year you try it small, and you, yeah. protect, you protect yourself all the way around. He, he's not going to mind this coming in his well, face. do it slowly and... In the course of testing his insurance idea, Martin has caught thousands of marine iguanas here in Hinovesa. The least I can do is lend a hand with one. <laughs> now, now he probably is onto this. He's not going to like this at all. Wow, that's a good one. Excellent. Excellent. I have good beginner's luck. <laughs> This iguana was first caught and marked by Martin when it was a hatchling. Twelve years later, it's one of the kings around here. But if another El Nino comes and this guy is too big, then we basically find his body on the beach at some day. That's the first one for the season, we just give him an A. The paint will make it easier to keep an eye on him. Is it possible that this will turn out to be some cue to the females that this guy should be avoided at all costs? Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> Do they many, take any visual cues? Uh, many people at conferences ask me. Oh, yeah? We, we did test it because in the Nolis, in other lizards, it would make a big difference. But in those guys, it doesn't. So the females don't go for coloration. They don't care about the markings we put on them. And um, they probably only go for the size and for the behavior. Yeah, but this guy is now clearly a movie star. I mean, they're going <laughs> to... Aren't they going to notice that? That is true. <laughs> so that's it for this guy. We can let him go. Okay. Martin Wikelski isn't the first scientist to catch and release marine iguanas here in the Galapagos. I threw one several times as far as I could into a deep pool left by the retiring tide. But it invariably returned in a direct line to the spot where I stood. Perhaps this singular piece of apparent stupidity may be accounted for by the circumstance that this reptile has no enemy whatever on the shore, whereas at sea, it must often fall a prey to the numerous sharks. Hence, probably urged by a fixed and hereditary instinct that the shore is its place of safety, whatever the emergency may be, it there takes refuge. Late one afternoon, Lynn and I found ourselves stepping carefully to avoid marine iguanas lounging before bedtime all over the waterfront of the island of Fernandina. Ooh, almost stepped on its tail. I remember my surprised and delighted reaction to the first marine iguana I saw, only a few days ago. But already they've become simply part of the place. But just watch them for a while. What an extraordinary story they tell. For hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years, they've lived and died here, slowly sculpted by that living and dying from the land creatures they once were 
into the imperious masters of their new marine environment. It's a story that for one giddy moment, it seems to me they deserve to hear. No, I'm serious. There's this guy, Charles Darwin, who says it's so. Look, you have to believe me. You all descended from some lizard a long time ago. Who, uh, could I see a show of claws? Who believes that? I should have known from my first encounter with a bird called the masked booby that this is a creature with a strange sense of right and wrong. Whoa. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, we got a little close to the guano ring there. My second encounter came in the company of Dave Anderson. All right, Alan. Here we've got a nestling masked booby with its parent who has conveniently stepped aside so that we can put a band on its chick. Dave has been studying masked boobies for half his life, trying to understand a singularly gruesome fact. Gently grab the bird. That this young booby, all fluffy and apparently innocent, may well have committed murder. This is maybe a 35, 40 day old masked booby chick. And it can give you a good nip. So if you would like to hold this bird. It can give you a good nip, so if I would like to hold. Is that a, like yeah. an actual sentence? Yeah, now don't squeeze it. Yeah. Just, and get up around the head so yeah. that you can sort of. Not only is this baby booby a natural born killer, you can grab the creature it may have killed right. was its own sibling. We're going to give this bird a name. Mm -hmm. It probably already has a name, but this is what I'm going to call it 95289. Mm -hmm. Dave Anderson, little Anderson little wants to know why the murder life. occurred. Even more, he wants to know why the parents did nothing to stop it. And we'll put this little chick back in its home. The little chick needs to calm down. There. To answer these questions, Anderson has been coming here to the island of Española for 20 years. Masked boobies breed in colonies, and things start off romantically enough. Some of these birds don't have a mate. And so when they're trying to find one, they check out different possibilities, and they get together, and they maybe have a date for an afternoon where they give each other little gifts, twigs, and stuff like that. And if they're not compatible, they'll know pretty quickly. And if they are compatible, maybe they continue. It's a lot like a species we know pretty well. <laughs> Most birds in other species make a real nest, and mass boobies don't, but the building of a nest and accumulation of material and showing what a great twig you've got is still part of the ritual. So it's another way of saying, you know, I'm in a family way. Are you? Do you like this twig? Maybe if we like the same kind of twig, we might be able to get together. But once the wedding bells have rung, the harsh reality of masked booby life begins. This parent has two chicks under it. One of them hatched about seven days ago, and the other one hatched out of this eggshell about two days ago. When the second chick hatched, it was a smaller size and less capable, and the first chick is gonna push this helpless second chick out of the nest if it behaves like normal mass booby chicks. For the first few days, the chicks amicably share their nest, but on day five, things turn nasty. The main thing the parent is providing for the chicks is shelter from the glaring sun. The older chick is trying to push the younger out from the shade to a slow but certain death. Throughout the struggle, the parent remains aloof and apparently indifferent. The parent is not going to do anything about this siblicide. We call it siblicide, the killing of a sibling. Uh, if it's like most mass booby parents, it will simply watch or look around or do something else, but it will not help this poor offspring that's being killed by its own sibling. The first time I saw this happen, I couldn't believe what bad luck 
the bee chick had. Uh, its closest relative in the world is throwing it out of the nest to die on the hot ground of sunstroke. Um, it's sort of a miserable thing to see. I've seen it enough times now that I accept that that's the normal way of booby life, but it is kind of shocking the first time you see it. Shocking, and in Darwinian terms, baffling. At least at first sight. After all, that's the parents' own genes lying there dying. I don't understand the economics of this. If she's going to lay two eggs, and everybody knows that the first one is going to kill the second one, why, why expend all that energy to lay a second egg? It, it seems like a waste. Yeah. In terms of natural selection, selection is going to maximize the excess benefits over the cost. So cer certainly the benefit has to exceed the cost. In this case, there's a benefit to laying the second egg, even if you only want one chick, because they have lousy hatching success. They only hatch about 60% of their eggs, even if you eliminate accidents and stuff. Something about uh, fertility or egg embryo development causes 40% of them to die. So if you're going to get one chick, you got to have one chick, you're prepared to pay the price of a second egg, even though it's expensive, because if the first one fails, the second one can take its place. It seems to me that once you've gone to the trouble of laying two eggs, and you have a good shot at having two healthy adults come out of that, isn't your purpose better served to, to let, let both of them live? Yeah, good question. If you experimentally stop the siblicide from happening, and make them play nice, yeah. and then challenge the parents to bring back enough food for two, uh, about 30% of the time, they can do it. She doesn't stop feeding. If there are two chicks in front of her, she'll feed them. You know, open mouth, put in food. That's what she does. And if there are two of them there, she puts it in at twice the rate. So you say, well, they definitely should be stopping the siblicide from happening. However, if you follow those parents another year, you find out in the year after they raise two chicks, they take it on the chin in terms of survival, particularly the moms. Regular moms survive at about 92% over from year to year, and the experimentals that have had to raise two chicks uh, survive at about 75%, and that's a, that's a huge cost. A cost that in terms of natural selection simply cannot be sustained. This is really fascinating, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm spending just a few hours talking to you about this, and you're spending your life on it. it. How did you get led to that? It's a problem that on the surface seems fairly easy to address. Uh, the problem being, why lay that second egg? Given that you lay the second egg, why not try to raise two chicks? But to actually look at how selection acts on individuals, you really ought to have a long-term perspective. And following the lifetime consequences of a long-lived animal may take up most of your career. Some of the birds that I have initiated um, the study of as babies are going to outlive my career.